I want to, on your behalf, extend warmest, our warmest welcome to our comrades from the International Committee. And we have two comrades from the SEP in the United States and one from the SEG in New Zealand. Those are on my immediate right, David North, who is the chairman of the International Editorial Board and of the Socialist Equality Party in the United States. Next to him is Evan Blake, who is uh, the coordinator of the Global Workers' Inquest into the COVID-19 pandemic. And both those comrades will be addressing the meeting tonight on the different publications, the two publications which we are launching. On our immediate uh, far right um, is Tom Peters, who is the uh, leader of the Socialist Equality Group in New Zealand. Tom and myself will be moderating tonight and uh, comrades uh, North and Blake will speak on uh, the, the publications which we are, which uh, Comrade North authored and which Comrade uh, Blake has uh, edited and pr uh, produced the introduction to, after which we will then open up for questions. Tom and I uh, will have some questions uh, for our speakers and you and online are welcome to also uh, present and, and ask any questions. The two publications that uh, we are uh, launching uh, tonight is uh, the, the first, which is Leon Trotsky and the Struggle for Socialism in the 21st Century, which was authored by Comrade David North, and COVID, Capitalism and the Class Struggle, which, as I said, uh, was introduced by Evan. Both are compilations of uh, our analysis. In particular, Comrade North will, uh, will be able to speak about the number of different articles that the, uh, the, the, Tro the Leon Trotsky book encompasses. And this, it, these are articles and lectures which span a period of 40 years. COVID capitalism and the class struggle is a very small fraction of the more than 6,000 articles which have been produced by the World Socialist website from January 2020 uh, to today. And so with that, again, on your behalf, we welcome comrades uh, David North and Evan Blake and uh, we'll uh, they will introduce uh, their, their publications and then we will open up for questions. Thank you, uh, Comrade Cheryl. Uh, I first of all want to say that uh, I am immensely, immensely uh, happy uh, to have had the opportunity to travel again to uh, Australia. Uh, it has been approximately three and a half years since I last made this trip. I must say that uh, a significant amount of uh, my political activity uh, in the course of my now pretty long political career, I have traveled frequently uh, to Australia. Uh, the first time in 1977, when I was just 27 years old, I uh, came to Australia to give lectures on security in the Fourth International, which uh, dealt with the initial findings of the International Committee's uh, investigation into the assassination of Leon Trotsky. And so I gave lectures in uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, and Brisbane. It was an unforgettable experience and very important because it uh, established direct relations uh, with the cater of what was then the Socialist Labor League, which proved to be enormously important when the crisis erupted in the International Committee. Uh, the next time I came to Australia, 
was actually nine years later in 1986, uh, when uh, in the aftermath of the split, when the International Committee was reworking and working through the implications of that really critical and decisive struggle, a struggle which uh, secured the survival of the Trotskyist movement and laid the basis for uh, its enormous political development over the last uh, now 38 years. Tonight I'm gonna to be speaking about uh, a book which has been published by Mary. Leon Trotsky and the struggle for socialism in the 21st century. Uh, this is a book which includes essays that have been written over a period of 41 years. The first set of essays were written in 19, in the autumn of 1982. Uh, the last set of articles that appear in uh, this volume have been written this year. Some of them, actually the last one, just a few, uh, a month or two ago. What is striking, looking back on this, the works in this volume, is the interconnectedness. I must say that uh, while the analysis has developed, the underlying theme of all the essays or lectures uh, and even a letter uh, that appear in this volume is that in the perspective of history, Leon Trotsky emerges as the decisive figure in the socialism of the 20th century and in the socialist movement of the 21st century. Now, there is no question that the two great figures of socialism in the 20th century are, of course, Lenin, uh, the founder of the Bolshevik party, and Trotsky. And it isn't my intention in that sense to compare one to the other, who was greater. That is not really the issue. Uh, both of these gigantic figures, uh, their role was determined, as it always is, by the historical circumstances in which they live. Uh, as Marx had famously said, men make history, but not of conditions of their own choosing. When we speak of Lenin and Trotsky, of course, we are aware uh, of the differences in the trajectory of their careers uh, dictated by one gigantic fact. Lenin died in 1924. Trotsky lived until 1940. And the period between 1940, excuse me, 1924 and 1940, uh, proved to be of monumental significance for the fate of world socialism. In 1935, Trotsky maintained a diary, which I think was published in 1958. It became known, it was published under the title Diary in Exile. Uh, Trotsky explained that he was not one really who often used the diary form, but he found himself in peculiar conditions in which this genre provided an opportunity for him to deal with questions which, uh, uh, to sort of engage in almost an internal dialogue with himself and ponder political questions. It's a fascinating and brilliant document. But one of the uh, interesting, or perhaps the most significant uh, passage uh, in that book is when Trotsky raises the question of his role in history. And Trotsky thinks of two major events in his life. 
The first, of course, is the fact that Trotsky was the organizer, unquestionably, of the October Revolution itself. <clears throat> the role that Trotsky played in the victory of the Bolshevik party, in the victory of the insurrection, and subsequently the victory of the Red Army over the counter-revolution was of monumental significance. I think it was once Lenin said, talking about Trotsky, and said, who else could build a model army? Who else could do what Trotsky has done? And Trotsky was, of course, rightly, but not in a egotistic or egomaniacal sense, Trotsky was aware and proud of the role he had played in that revolution, or shouldn't he be? But he said that he still believed that even without him, there is the possibility that the revolution could have succeeded. He said it would not have succeeded without Lenin. And that was for very specific political reasons related to Lenin's astonishing authority in the Bolshevik party itself. So without Lenin, it is doubtful that uh, he himself could have overcome resistance within the Bolshevik party uh, to the taking of power. And indeed, the turn by Lenin to Trotsky, and Trotsky's rapid elevation into the leadership of the Bolshevik party was only possible because Lenin had come to accept the correctness of Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution, his evaluation of the nature of the bourgeois democratic revolution in the 20th century, country with a belated capitalist development, the socialist revolution, the bourgeois democratic revolution could only be completed in the form of a socialist revolution. So while Trotsky recognized his obviously very important role in 1917, he said, I don't think it was indispensable. He said, however, my role today is indispensable. No other person is in a position to maintain the continuity of the Marxist movement. And what did he mean by that? In the aftermath of the death of Lenin, or even as Lenin was dying, uh, a conflict had erupted inside the Bolshevik party, uh, which <clears throat> over time revealed itself to be a struggle between different social forces over the most fundamental question of perspective, uh, the Stalinist faction, which first uh, emerged or began to emerge in 1923, 24, uh, and then articulated uh, the uh, theory of Stalin and Bukharin, the theory of socialism in one country, set into motion a process of bureaucratic and nationalist counter-revolution against the perspective of October. Uh, Trotsky, and in the autumn of this year, we will begin to observe formally the, the centenary of the founding of the Trotskyist movement. Trotsky played the seminal and central role in the development of an organized political opposition uh, to this process of Stalinist degeneration. And all the great questions which emerged in the aftermath of 1923, in which uh, great struggles were to decide the fate of socialism for the rest of the century were fought out. The British general strike of 1926, betrayed by the policies of the British Communist Party carried out at the behest of the Soviet bureaucracy. The defeat of the Chinese Revolution in 1927, the direct product of the subordination of the Communist Party to the bourgeois regime of uh, the bourgeois government uh, movement, a uh, party of uh, uh, the Kuomintang led by Chiang Kai-shek. Most devastating of all, uh, the defeat of the German proletariat uh, by Hitler as a consequence of the uh, uh, policies of uh, social fascism imposed upon the German Communist Party uh, by the Stalinists and the subsequent betrayals of social revolution throughout Europe and internationally under the banner of the Popular Front, added to that the criminal massacre, annihilation of virtually all remnants of the Bolshevik party or its revolutionary generation uh, by the Stalinist regime. 
uh, Trotsky was, uh, uh, tr tr the writings of Trotsky was the Marxist response to these betrayals. He, sub he subjected all of these events to the most careful critical analysis. And on that basis, he laid the basis politically for the establishment of the Fourth International, which he first called for 90 years ago in the aftermath of the defeat of the German working class by Hitler, and then carried to its uh, organizational completion in 1938, 85 years ago, uh, with the formal founding of the Fourth International. This is important to stress, and uh, the point uh, that I know I've made many times in lectures and in articles, is that when we think of Trotsky's role and the extraordinary contribution that he made to the development of Marxism, what one is struck by more than anything else is the staggeringly contemporary character of his work. Uh, more than any other Marxist, and even Lenin, and that is not to say that there is not immense relevance, indeed there is, in what Lenin writes, but the political problems which we deal with are so profoundly connected to Trotsky's analysis. They're really, yes, it's true. The world moves on and things change, but perhaps with justifiable exaggeration, I have sometimes in discussing a political situation or to illustrate the point, have said, you know, if Trotsky were to walk into this room and say, well, what's the political situation? I think he could rather rapidly orient himself. He would say, well, what happened in the Soviet Union? And so, well, you know, it was dissolved in 1991, as you predicted in the revolution betrayed. He said, what was the, you know, he would very rapidly understand the political situation. I mean, terms such as the death agony of capitalism. World socialist revolution, the globalization of the class struggle, the bankruptcy of the bourgeois nation state. These are terms which are eminently applicable to our own time. But let me illustrate this point. We're now dealing with the war in Ukraine. Now, what would Trotsky have to say about this? Well, as it turns out, actually, I uh, included in this uh, collection is a rather brief essay I wrote last August to commemorate uh, the uh, 82nd anniversary of the assassination of Trotsky, which is titled Trotsky and the Self-Determination of Ukraine. And uh, I called attention to what Trotsky wrote on the question of Ukraine in 1939, during the final year of his life. And he said the following, and this is just a few months before the outbreak of the Second World War. He said, the Ukraine question is destined in the immediate future to play an enormous role in the life of Europe. It is not for nothing that Hitler so noisily raised the question of creating a greater Ukraine. And likewise, it was not for nothing that he dropped the question with such stealthy haste. He then, <clears throat> And I'll just read a passage uh, as, as I connect various paragraphs. I wrote, uh, Trotsky recognized the legitimacy of the striving of the Ukrainian masses for national self-determination. The formation of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics by the Bolshevik government in 1922, when Lenin and Trotsky were still the dominant figures, insisted on the voluntary character of the Union and opposed all tendencies to subordinate its Ukrainian component to the pressure of great Russian chauvinism. 
The Declaration of Union and Treaty of Union, dated December 30th, 1922, defined the USSR as, quote, a voluntary union of equal peoples, unquote, whose formation would prove, quote, a decided step toward the union of the workers of all countries in a World Socialist Soviet Federation, unquote. But by the late 1930s, 15 years of escalating violations of socialist internationalism and bureaucratic terror and despotism had generated deep hostility among the Ukrainian masses toward the Soviet Union and created a constituency for the revival of the most reactionary political tendencies. Trotsky wrote, and again, I'm quoting Trotsky's from March, 1939. Not a trace remains of the former confidence and sympathy of the Western Ukrainian masses for the Kremlin. Since the latest murderous purge in the Kremlin in the Ukraine, no one in the West wants to become part of the Kremlin satrapy, which continues to bear the name of the Soviet Ukraine. The worker and peasant masses in Western Ukraine, in Bukovina, and the Carpatho Ukraine are in a state of confusion. Where to turn? What to demand? This situation naturally shifts the leadership to the most re reactionary Ukrainian cliques who express their so-called nationalism by seeking to sell the Ukrainian people to one imperialism or another in return for the promise of fictitious independence. Upon this tragic confusion, Hitler bases his policy in the Ukrainian question. At one time we said, but for Stalin, but for the fatal policy of the Comintern in Germany, there would have been no Hitler. To this now can be added, but for the rape of Soviet Ukraine by the Stalinist bureaucracy, there would be no Hitlerite Ukrainian policy. Now changing what has to be changed. The policy of contemporary imperialism, of Biden, of British imperialism, the Australian bourgeoisie, all the other members of NATO and its different uh, instruments and agencies build their policy on the completely bankrupt policies of Putin, who is himself uh, a legacy of the tragic uh, and reactionary policies of Stalinism. And Trotsky's analysis remains to this day a basic guide for understanding the processes which are presently at work. <clears throat> I must say, in one of the essays here, I, 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 I spoke in Kiev in 1991, just two months before the dissolution of the USSR, and specifically addressed the question of Ukrainian nationalism and warned that one of the consequences of the dissolution of the Soviet Union would be almost inevitably the outbreak of fratricidal struggle uh, between Ukrainians and uh, Russians. And this is what has happened. Now, there's another point I'd like to raise about the book, and it goes to the uh, significance of Trotskyism and Trotsky's role. There's an old saying, books have their own fate. Uh, the first set of essays that appear in this book were written in October 1982. And uh, strangely enough, when I began writing what became an extended series of articles, I actually began with the intention of simply writing a tribute to a member of the Workers' League who had been assassinated in 1977, Tom Hinehan. It was the fifth anniversary of his assassination. And I set out initially to pay tribute to his memory, but in the course of writing it, uh, my attention turned to the question of how did a young man like Tom Heenan become a cater in our movement? On what basis was he educated? How was he trained? And it so happened at that very time, it was becoming increasingly clear that the dominant section within the International Committee, the Workers' Revolutionary Party, was moving very far from its Trotskyist moorings, that many of the, well, the, the principles upon which 
the principles for which it had fought in the struggle against Pablism were being abandoned. And uh, as an element of this, while tribute was paid to Trotsky, there were meetings held to honor the memory of Trotsky, more and more it was being suggested that somehow Trotsky was old hat, that uh, it was not that Trotskyism, the political lessons of Trotskyism were not the basis for the training of Cater, the great historical experience which he had analyzed, but a very abstract, distorted, and essentially uh, idealist falsification of Marxism was being substituted. And I was particularly uh, incensed uh, by the suggestion uh, that uh, somehow uh, the basis of cater, educate, cater education uh, involved uh, an incantation of Hegelian phraseology, a falsification of the relationship of Marxism to dialectical philosophy, and in which Trotsky had very little to say. So in the course of writing, uh, and this, happens, my attention turned to the historical development of Trotsky and the manner in which it was in the works of Trotsky that we could understand the relationship of Marxism to the struggles of the working class, which is the real concern of Marxism. Yes, it is true that Marxism can be described as a world scientific outlook, but what is of particular concern to Marxists, to genuine Marxists, is how the great opus and scientific work of Marx and Engels relate to the fundamental problem of the con conquest of power by the working class. We are not academics, academicians. We are concerned with coming to grips with the fact that unless there is a socialist revolution, the world is doomed. And the only force which could carry through this revolution is the working class. That is the central truth which must be assimilated and understood by everyone who considers himself or herself a Marxist. And of course, it is in the work of Trotsky and in Lenin, but Trotsky in the aftermath of Lenin's death, that the great, that the powerful methodology of Marxism, of historical materialist analysis, is applied to provide an answer to the great political problems and questions of our time. And this is uh, what this book is concerned with. If nothing else, I'm going to put it so much different. I've, I've obviously written uh, a great deal about Trotsky. Uh, many of the uh, articles which I've written about Trotsky have inevitably been concerned with defending Trotsky. I once said in jest, I feel like at times like a lawyer who has just one client. I have been compelled again and again to respond to lies told about Leon Trotsky. Now, in this very fact, there is as well a great contemporary significance. Why are the lies about Trotsky so persistent? Even now, for example, in the United States, the democratic, so-called democratic socialists, which is an agency of the Democratic Party, which feels increasing pressure from the World Socialist website and the influence of the International Committee, it has a whole faction which tends to respond to the critiques of the ICFI and the World Socialist website by drawing, by posting ice picks in their denunciations of our movement. Why this visceral hatred of Trotsky? More than any other figure, why is this figure so I don't, why does he provoke such rage? And the answer is because discussions about Trotsky are never just discussions about the past. They always tend to be discussions about the present. It's not just about 
how I don't know, like to use just, it's not only about your assessment about of the October revolution. It's about how you view the world today. The politics which are required to establish the political independence of the working class or to base the socialist movement or what is called socialism on the class struggle of the working class and the perspective of world socialism. So of course, the historical questions are always uppermost and, and I've had to address them again and again. But this other element of Trotsky is of decisive importance. And this is what this book is concerned with. It establishes that it is Trotskyism, which is the, is the form of socialism, at least as that term would have been understood by Marx, Engels, and Lenin himself, and Lux Rosa Luxemburg, all those who understood Marxism to be most decisively the means of arming the working class for the struggle against capitalism and its revolutionary overthrow and the victory of world socialism. So this is what the essays in this book are really concerned with, establishing again and again the connection between historical experience and present day tasks that it's only in the development of this movement that one has the expression of the contemporary development of Marxism and the revolutionary organization of the working class. So I hope that uh, this book will contribute to the uh, rearming of uh, the working class. I'll just conclude by saying we are witnessing a profound change. We are in a revolutionary crisis. I said to comrade Nick yesterday, he's comrade Nick Beams has written a great deal on the crisis of capitalism. And I said yesterday, well, you know, we've really won that argument. You know, anyone who doesn't believe there's a crisis of capitalism is, uh, you know, has lost uh, virtually all capacity for sensory perception, let alone thought. That argument has been won. The question is the following, and I, I can pose this in the sharpest way possible. The Ukraine war is not going away. This war is metastasizing into a struggle, into a conflict of ever greater dimensions. It is the opening episodes of an, what will soon be clear to be a world war. It has the most uh, dangerous implications. And the historical situation in which we find ourselves presents itself as follows. What will develop more rapidly? The drive of the ruling elites, with their recklessness uh, toward a catastrophe, their response to a global crisis for which they have no rational answer. You know, one can look at their policy and say, well, you know, don't they realize this could result in a nuclear war? This is insane. And it's true, it's, it is insane. But even when we talk about insane policies, Hitler was insane, but the insanity of Hitler can be explained materialistically and historically in the objective contradictions of German capitalism. Biden is not insane in the sense that Hitler is insane. He may be senile, he's not insane. And yet he's pursuing, along with Macron, and all the others, your Albanese here in Australia, policies which in their logical unfolding lead to a cataclysm. I mean, no one believes, can possibly believe that a war with China is just what Australia needs. But we understand that what drive, all we can infer from this is that their actions are a response to contradictions which have closed off rational responses. Again, I was mentioning uh, a book I've been reading uh, about the beginning of the First World War, an excellent book called Pandora's Box. 
And the question that the historian raises about the origins of the First World War is that you know, there had been a whole series of previous sharp crises, and each time there was an intervention to prevent these crises from acquiring an all European global dimension. But in 1914, that didn't happen. All the decisions ultimately were made for war with its cataclysmic consequences for all of Europe and all the world. Now we can understand the deeper roots of that process, which the Marxists explain more profoundly than anyone else in Lenin's imperialism and Trotsky's war in the international, the crisis of the nation state system and so on. So now we see this crisis unfolding and if we can recognize the enormous scale and the enormous dangers, and they are very real, Why are they doing this? Well, you have to look at the implications of the striving of the United States for hegemony, the relationship of hegemony to the defense of the role of the dollar, which is the basis of America's global role, the fear that the emergence of substantial competitors will undermine dollar supremacy and therefore the world role of the United States and its shattering implications within the United States itself for social relationships. So that's what drives this crisis. How will it, what is the alternative? Well, as I said, there are two processes at work. There is the processes which lead through the contradictions of capitalism to devastating war and cataclysm. But those very contradictions also produce social revolution. And if one can look at the present situation, and here is a very significant difference, one might even say to 1914. Alongside the, in 1914, the war took everyone unawares in a sense. They weren't prepared. And it was, there was a period of about two years of almost death-like stillness in the midst of the horrifying battles of Verdun, Somme, Ypres, thousands of people being mowed down each day on the Western Front and also in the East. And then the confusion and disorientation produced by the betrayals of the social democracy began to dissipate and there was a revolutionary reorganization of the working class, which found its highest expression in the very rapid rise of Bolshevism in 1917 with its world implications. What we already see, and yes, there is, I'm not making a direct comparison, but one element which is really striking, we are already witnessing on a world scale, a huge development of class struggle. The ruling elites are waging a two-front war against Russia, against China, but also against their own working classes. Macron in France is at war with the French people. The British Tories and their social democratic labor right allies are at war against the working class in Britain. The American ruling class simply will not tolerate even the most limited forms of class action by the working class, which is being radicalized. And that process is really sweeping throughout the world. And keep in mind that we live in a world, and this is perhaps the greatest verification of Trotsky's political perspective and vision. The battalions of the working class today are far larger and far greater than that which was available to the Bolsheviks and to the Fourth International in the 1930s or the 1940s. The African continent is witnessing the emergence of proletarian centers in urban areas which have populations of 20, 30, even 40 million by the end of this decade. Latin America, cities such as Sao Paulo with its vast proletariat, the possibilities objectively for social revolution are greater than at any time in world history. And that social revolution, the perspective that will guide that revolution will be found 
in those in that movement which bases itself, yes, on the whole historical legacy of Marxism. But above all, it will be identified with the figure of Leon Trotsky. And that is what the International Committee of the Fourth International represents. And uh, which all of you, those of you who are not members of our movement, should join and strive to build. We are in a new epoch of social revolution. And uh, it's to that which this uh, book is essentially dedicated. Thank you very much, comrades. Before I, in, I open up for, for Evan, I just want to let you know that there are 70 people online um, also listening and watching this event, which and from all over the country, from West Australia, uh, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, Thailand, New Zealand. I mean, this is this is uh, an event which is being accessed internationally because these are publications for international workers, and uh, and so with that I'd like to uh, ask you to welcome Evan who is uh, visiting Australia for the first time and most assuredly won't be the last <laughs> um, and Evan has become an expert on the uh, development of the pandemic he has developed the uh, uh, the um, uh, knowledge and expertise in terms of both the development, uh, the spread of, of the virus, but also on the measures necessary and the social force necessary uh, to, to eliminate COVID, and that is the working class. Well, first, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, as Cheryl said, it's my first time in Australia as well as Sydney, and uh, it's really it's been a wonderful trip. Uh, and I just also wanted to thank everyone for wearing masks and uh, just, I would second the points that uh, Cheryl made on this. Uh, it's it's really, uh, I think, it, you know, it's an extraordinary fact that this event and uh, the meeting in San Diego are, you know, virtually unprecedented uh, in the, you know, the entire experience of the pandemic. And I think, you know, the refusal of uh, capitalist world governments, as well as the World Health Organization to really explain airborne transmission uh, and the need for wearing N95 masks, for ventilation, for HEPA filters. It's really, you know, it's one of the greatest crimes uh, that's been committed over the, the course of the pandemic. Uh, and especially in the past year and the, the efforts to denigrate masking and to discourage their, their use. And now as we're seeing most recently, the uh, lifting of uh, requirements in healthcare settings uh, throughout the world. Um, and I, you know, I think I just wanted to begin by really stressing that uh, contrary to the, the lies of capitalist world governments and even the World Health Organization, uh, the pandemic is nowhere near over. Uh, according to The Economist, a uh, tracker of excess deaths, there have now been uh, 22 million deaths attributable to the pandemic globally. Uh, and at present, they estimate that there continue to be 11,500 excess deaths every day uh, throughout the world, uh, which amounts to another 1 million deaths every three months. Uh, and for the first time since World War II, uh, life expectancy has declined uh, declined globally during the first two years of the pandemic and will likely uh, decline again for 2022. Uh, and just recently, the, uh, the World Health Organization uh, noted that during the first two years of the, the pandemic, the world's population lost 337 million years of life. Uh, and by this point, that figure is now likely approaching 500 million. And in addition to the, the uh, millions of lives lost, hundreds of millions of people are now grieving uh, the loss of these uh, loved ones. Uh, and then there's the mass disabling event of long COVID, uh, which continues uh, each day. Uh, there's a recent report led by uh, Dr. Eric Topol uh, in the United States at the Scripps Institute. And, uh, Hannah Davis, who's a leading long COVID advocate, which conservatively estimated that the uh, that there's at least 65 million people uh, throughout the world who are likely suffering from long COVID. Uh, and the real figure is, uh, it's likely much higher, possibly in the hundreds of millions. And I think it's important to stress that uh, there have been many other uh, viruses and uh, pathogens that cause 
uh, sort of post-viral illness and you know lingering symptoms, uh, but there's nothing like this in uh, in human history in terms of the the scale of uh, what we're seeing with with long COVID. In the U.S., the CDC estimates that there's roughly 20 million people uh, suffering from long COVID, and uh, I. In our recent article, we note that in Australia, uh, the Burnett Institute estimates that 500,000 adults are, are now suffering from long COVID here. And I, I uh, just wanted to stress also that really, you know, over the past, uh, there's been a major shift over the past year and a half. And I think, you know, the response of capitalist governments uh, to the emergence of the Omicron variant has really been cold blooded and catastrophic. Uh, governments throughout the world uh, seized on the emergence of this variant, uh, which was high, is highly infectious and vaccine resistant to scrap basically whatever limited mitigation measures were still in, in place and to embrace the herd immunity strategy that was initially identified with the far right. And I think um, one of the countries where this was expressed most sharply is here in Australia, where as ever, I'm sure everyone here knows, but Chief Medical Officer Paul Kelly uh, said that Omicron uh, could be his quote, number one Christmas present, end quote. And so due to the, the process of the, the past year, the scrapping of, of testing, uh, contact tracing, we now have no accurate way to measure the real spread of the virus. Uh, but in countries where wastewater tracking is done, we can see that viral transmission remains far higher than during uh, any of the lulls in between waves uh, during uh, 2020 and 2021. There's essentially a very high baseline of infections and the virus is continuing to, to circulate. And just today, uh, we published an article on the WSWS, which notes that China is now in the throes of the second major wave of the pandemic uh, since they lifted the zero COVID elimination strategy uh, last November. Uh, and on Monday, Dr. Zhang Nanshan, uh, who played really a central role in crafting the zero COVID policy in China, announced that this uh, latest wave, uh, which is expected to, to peak in late June, uh, will uh, in fact, is it anticipated to infect uh, upwards of 65 million people uh, per week. And I think the, uh, the warnings that really only the WSWS made about the lifting of zero COVID in China uh, have been proven absolutely correct. Uh, they, when they did this, they re basically repeated the, the lies of other capitalist governments that this would be a one-off event, uh, that they would go through in what they called an exit wave, uh, and then basically return to normal. And what we're seeing instead is that they've basically been integrated into this you know, dystopian reality of, of perpetual uh, mass infection, repeated waves of uh, mass infection and death. Um, and you know, just uh, in the first wave last winter, they estimate that at least uh, 1 million people, potentially over 2 million uh, died in China in the space of just three months, uh, which was one of the most, um, alongside the Delta wave in India was the most concentrated wave of, of death during the pandemic. And now uh, many more thousands will likely perish in the coming weeks. Uh, and and uh, the dangers of viral evolution are ongoing. Uh, every principled virologist in the world uh, would agree that at any point, a far more dangerous variant could evolve. And in fact, in recent weeks, there's been a number of uh, statements to that effect. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Deborah Burks, who is the first uh, COVID response coordinator uh, under Trump in the US, uh, said that in the coming months, she anticipates that uh, Paxlovid will uh, no longer be effective uh, if there's a, or when, when a new variant emerges uh, that uh, basically renders it ineffective. And so despite all the propaganda, the pandemic is ongoing and it remains very dangerous. And I think in this context, this book, COVID, capitalism, and class war is immensely relevant. Uh, this is volume one of what will be a multi-volume series on the pandemic, uh, compiling all of the most critical statements, uh, polemics, uh, interviews with scientists, uh, statements by the different national sections of the ICFI, uh, and other material that's been produced by the, the World Socialist website throughout the pandemic. Uh, and really the greatest uh, challenge in editing this, uh, this book was selecting what to include and what to leave out. Uh, as Cheryl said, we've now published over 6,000 articles uh, on, on the pandemic uh, since January, 2020. Uh, and this is a 400 page volume, which includes uh, just 81 of the most essential 
uh, statements that we've written from throughout the world. And I wanted to stress that it really is uh, the product of the collective effort of hundreds of comrades in the ICFI uh, from throughout the world, writers, editors, proofreaders, uh, comrades involved in uh, producing the, the website, the production staff. Uh, it's been really an immense um, collective effort from our international movement. And really no other political party or news outlet in the world, uh, in particular among uh, those on the pseudo left, has even remotely uh, come close to this record. Uh, as Cheryl said, the majority of the pseudo left tendencies greeted the pandemic with indifference, uh, wrote barely anything in the first uh, in the first few months, in the first year, uh, and you know essentially uh, treated it as a as a non event. And I think really to understand uh, why the ICFI responded to the pandemic, uh, unlike any other tendency. One has to examine this book in connection to what uh, Dave has spoken of in, in relation to his book, uh, Leon Trotsky and the Struggle for Socialism in the 20, 21st Century. Uh, and I think this book really represents the application of Marxism and Trotsky, Trotskyism uh, to contemporary reality uh, and an analysis of the world historic event of the, the pandemic. In the preceding, uh, in the decades preceding the pandemic, the period uh, during during which uh, the articles in uh, Dave's book were, were published, uh, it's important to understand that there was really a renaissance of, of Trotskyism uh, within the ICFI, in particular uh, coming out of the, the split in uh, 1986, uh, 85 to 86. And really uh, since the 1980s, we are the only political party in the world which has comprehensively analyzed the nature of globalization, uh, the financialization of the economy, uh, the protracted degeneration of the trade unions, the unending and eruption of American imperialism after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, the attacks on democratic rights and the threat of fascism, uh, and efforts to really replace a scientific world outlook uh, with the subjective irrationalism of postmodernism. Uh, and finally, the refusal of capitalism to scientifically address climate change or the growing threat of uh, zoonotic spillover events. Uh, and if you go back and look at the coverage of the WSWS uh, since it was founded in 1998, uh, we've covered every new infectious disease outbreak uh, that occurred during the first two, in particular, the, uh, there was an uptick in uh, beginning uh, in the, the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, and really with each outbreak, uh, SARS, CoV-1, uh, MERS, uh, H5 N or H1N1, uh, the um, Ebola, uh, the Zika virus outbreak. Uh, there, we covered them. We covered each outbreak and really uh, continuously warned that capitalism was totally unprepared for the growing threat of a of a catastrophic pandemic. Uh, and we understood that uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, that the necessary response would be prevented by two essential elements of the capitalist system, the division of the world into rival nation states and the subordination of all social needs to private profit. And I think, real sorry, the, the focus of this book uh, is on 2020, uh, which I'm sure everyone here recalls very vividly. Uh, and in a sense, I think it's, it's somewhat difficult to read this volume because one realizes the profound truth that had the warnings of the ICFI been, been heeded and been followed, uh, the, the pandemic could have been stopped and millions of lives could have been saved throughout the world. Uh, the first article which we published on the pandemic, as Cheryl said earlier, was on January 24th, 2020, uh, before there were even reports of cases in the US. And then just four days later, uh, the WSWS published our first uh, perspective statement. Both documents are, are in here. And I just wanted to quote a brief passage from, uh, from that statement, which was again published on uh, January 28, 2020, before most people uh, really were even aware uh, that, that, their, that this uh, SARS-CoV-2 was, was spreading. Uh, and we wrote uh, in the conclusion of that perspective, the short-term mercenary profit schemes that are inherent to capitalism are incapable of allocating the resources necessary to plan ahead and prepare for global risks. Rooted in the nation state system, every capitalist country presses for its own advantage in the present while sacrificing the future, cutting across serious and scientifically necessary international collaboration. These conflicts are only escalating. At a time when rational planning across national borders 
is critical to combat the global spread of a virulent disease, the United States and Canada are, sorry, sorry, the United States and China are locked in a growing trade conflict in what has been called a new Cold War. Even as new pathogens require the scientific resources of every continent to combat, the countries of the world are building metaphorical and literal walls. The defense of human civilization against the threat of global pandemics, just like climate change and the growing threat of ecological disasters, requires a level of planning and global cooperation of which capitalism is incapable. Society has outgrown the capitalist system and the arbitrary divisions it imposes on the world. The provision of the most existential social needs requires social planning. That is, it requires socialism. In the following month, uh, in February 2020, uh, the New York Times and virtually the entire corporate media uh, internationally uh, went silent on the pandemic. And uh, on, in contrast, we continued to cover its development uh, following the situation in China, in particular, on the global spread of the virus. Um, and let's see, on uh, February 28, uh, 2020, we published a critical statement uh, by the ICFI, which was titled, For a Globally Coordinated Emergency Response to the Pandemic. And this was published when there were just 100,000 official cases worldwide and nearly 3,000 deaths. And we outlined a comprehensive program which would have stopped the pandemic in its tracks. Uh, just at one part, we say, in the first uh, demand, uh, global mobilization, we say, the response to the coronavirus cannot be coordinated on a nation by nation level. The virus does not respect borders or visa and immigration restrictions. The global networks of transportation and economic integration have turned the virus into a global problem. The solution must be global. Scientists from all over the world must be allowed to share their research and technology, unencumbered by the national interests and geopolitical conflicts that serve only to delay the development of effective countermeasures to contain, cure, and ultimately eradicate the coronavirus. And I think it's, it's highly significant that in this statement, which again was published in late February, 2020, the WSWS outlined a strategy uh, to eradicate SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the volume has many similar statements from throughout the year uh, in which we outlined a programmatic response to the pandemic at each stage of its development. Uh, we continuously uh, analyzed the, uh, the scientific development of the pandemic and the political crisis uh, and really the in particular, the homicidal uh, back to work campaign uh, and raised uh, demands for the working class to assert its own independent interests in opposition to the homicidal policies of the capitalist governments, uh, the corporations and their lackeys in the, in the trade unions. And one of these statements uh, was directed to auto workers in the US and it was read by thousands, uh, I believe actually tens of thousands uh, and helped uh, precipitate wildcat strikes, which led to the initial shutdown of the auto industry across North America. Um, I just wanted to conclude really by stressing that the pandemic represents uh, the most colossal breakdown of, of the world capitalist system since World War II. And one of the central concepts that we developed uh, in April and May 2020 is that the pandemic is a trigger event in world history, uh, akin to the assassination of Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand on June 28th, 1914, which triggered the outbreak of World War I. And we foresaw at the time that the pandemic would profoundly accelerate uh, the destabilization of world capitalism, and it would set the stage for the outbreak of an imperialist redivision of the world and the eruption of, of social revolution. Uh, as was, and this was proven correct, the pandemic uh, produced unprecedented labor shortages, uh, caused a spiraling uh, global economic crisis uh, with massive inflation, which was further exacerbated by the war in Ukraine. And it really set the stage uh, for the outbreak of the war, uh, the war in Ukraine, which as, as we've noted is really the antechamber to World War III. And I think the criminal pandemic policies of every government have really exposed the brutality of capitalism, uh, but it also has radicalized uh, masses of workers throughout the world. Uh, we've seen a steady escalation of the class struggle uh, over the past two years, uh, which has now reached a, a fever pitch. And really, you know, the, the pandemic and the looming threat of world war can only be stopped through the global revolutionary struggles of the working class. And I think it's important to understand that what has happened thus far in the first uh, three and a half years of the pandemic, this has to be seen as a warning 
Uh, we now know uh, that in the case of far more dangerous variant evolves, or if there's another spillover event which causes another pandemic, uh, that the ruling elites will not take even the most minimal measures which were, were done at the start of the pandemic. Uh, and the, uh, I think really, you know, the most, um, sort of the fundamental significance of this, this book and the coming volumes that we're working on is, is really that they trace the political, economic, social, and scientific development of the pandemic, and they draw out the key political lessons at each stage. And this really is an indispensable tool uh, to educate and develop socialist consciousness uh, within the working class to prepare for the coming struggles. And I think the, you know, the pandemic really amounts to a monumental social crime, and those responsible must and will be held accountable. And it's intimately uh, the, the study of this book uh, by, by workers, uh, by young people is really deeply connected to the, the fight to develop the global workers inquest into the pandemic, uh, which the WSWS launched in November 2021, uh, which really it remains the only independent investigation into the crimes that have been committed uh, globally during the, the pandemic. Uh, so I'll conclude there. I just encourage everyone to uh, read, everyone that's here in person and, and watching online uh, to purchase the book, to study it carefully, uh, and to participate in the inquest, and then to draw the necessary conclusions from this experience. And I would second what, what Dave said. I would encourage everyone here to, to join the SEP, uh, to take up the fight for socialism and the fight for global elimination, which we now know can only be achieved under a, a world socialist society. So, thank you. I do have a comment from Craig Wallace, uh, who is a leading spokesman for people with disability Australia and who um, has very importantly undertaken a major campaign against the impact that COVID and the policies of the of the Australian government has had on disabled people that he rightly refers to as social murder um, of, of our people. And he has uh, uh, tweeted the, uh, the advertisement for our meeting tonight and has uh, in response to uh, Comrade Dave's comment that the ruling class is at war with uh, with its population, he said that uh, greetings from Canberra, which of course is Parliament House, we, meaning the political um, establishment, are also in a war against disabled people and older people. He says solidarity from disabled people who are at the front line, uh, this is social murder of our people. And uh, he, he's very appreciative of uh, the, the contributions of uh, both our comrades. Uh, there is a question um, that has come from um, uh, Morgan in Melbourne, who asks David whether he could describe the genesis of this book. When did he first think it necessary to produce the book? What were the specific conditions which underlay this decision? So possibly we could start with that. Um, Well, the genesis, as I was trying to explain in my opening remarks, uh, was in the autumn of 1982. Uh, very serious uh, problems had emerged within the International Committee. I mean, the Workers' Revolutionary Party in Britain was veering ever more openly away from foundational programmatic conceptions of uh, the Fourth International. And the struggle that uh, had led uh, to the founding of the International Committee itself in 1953 and the op opposition of the International Committee to the reunification with Pablism in 1963, there was an abandonment to sum up really of the theory of permanent revolution and adaptation uh, to various bourgeois national regimes the labor bureaucracies. And all of this was uh, covered over, first of all, with a denigration of excuse, historical significance and the promotion of something which was called the practice of cognition, 
essentially a form of crude pragmatism, which dismissed the significance and centrality of the great historical experiences out of which the Fourth International emerged. <clears throat> the argument was that the education of Cater was not on the basis of these experiences, but on uh, the uh, acquisition of uh, a mystified dialectical method which supposedly provided a master key or which uh, obviated the necessity of studying anything. Clearly, it had nothing to do with uh, dialectics as it would have been understood by Lenin and, and Trotsky. And so in the course of writing this, <clears throat> uh, as I said before, the in answering the question, how did Tom Henehan become a cater? How are cater trained in the socialist movement? Uh, I began a recapitulation of the major experiences of the Trotskyist movement, the central role played by Trotsky himself. And the basic argument was that the assimilation of the lessons of these experiences are the foundation of the development of Marxist cater. And uh, only within that context can one understand what dialectical materialism is. What This is not a mystical method. It is, in essence, one might say, a historically informed approach to the development of the class struggle on an international scale. And the essential uh, lessons of that struggle are drawn from the systematic study of the history of the Trotskyist movement. And uh, within that context, I set out to demonstrate uh, Trotsky's very conscious uh, utilization of the dialectical method. Uh, in his analysis of such phenomena as, well, of course, the Soviet bureaucracy, in his uh, study of the contradictions of capitalism, uh, I demonstrated that he was, of course, the greatest master of dialectics uh, in the modern historical period. I said he was one of these writers where, you know, you, in great art, you don't see the seams. You don't see the work. It's there. Uh, he was, uh, I made the point that he was a, he was such a great writer that one tends at times to take for granted the profound his, uh, theoretical content of his writing. And now I was answering Jerry Healy, uh, the leaders of the WRP, and uh, actually hoping in the writings of these essays uh, that it would encourage a re-examination and discussion of the uh, errors which were being made in the International Committee. Uh, that was not the result. In fact, uh, they refused to discuss anything. And uh, in the course of the next uh, year and two years, it became increasingly evident uh, that uh, this was an organization which was systematically breaking with every principle, and it finally uh, led to an open uh, struggle and a reorganization of uh, the majority of the International Committee, including, of course, its Australian section, on a generally Trotskyist foundation. So, you know, as I said, books have, a, have their own fate. I could not have imagined uh, in 1982, when the writing began, that ultimately this book would have such significance in the struggle which developed within the International Committee and in the education of the movement. And I must say, yeah, as a writer, it's and as a revolutionist, uh, you know, one goes back and rereads something one wrote many, many decades ago. And, uh, and one has to study it oneself. You know, it's something which I think when one, you know, in serious writing, you have to somehow raise yourself above yourself and try to work and think systematically, which is hard to do. Um, 
but going back over it, um, I think it stands the test of time. And certainly when I read it today, and I hope, and I believe that's the response of Cater within our movement, uh, they don't look at the book and say, well, that was all for, yeah, well, you know. No, I think it really holds together. And it's certainly, uh, there is a continuity between the last articles and the first articles. And the basic conception of Trotsky's relationship to Marxism, Trotsky's role in world history uh, has been substantiated. Again, remember when this was first written in 1982, the Soviet Union still existed. The communist parties were all mass parties. Uh, Healy himself had begun to refer to the Trotskyists as Trotskyite grupos. You know, he was speaking of his own organization with contempt. And yet within a very short period of time, all of these great so-called mass organizations and real existing socialism would prove to be nothing. Or to utilize the great Hegelian formulation, all that exists deserves to perish. In other words, the uh, Stalinist bureaucracy, for all its apparent reality, had become unreal and was doomed. And the Trotskyist movement, however small it was, because it represented the accurately the logic of the historical process, uh, it prevailed. And one can say today, there is not another movement in the world outside of our own that can make with any credibility the claim to represent revolutionary Marxism. I just listening to Karmat Evans' remarks. We've passed through, and we are still in the midst of a staggering global crisis. This is the greatest public health crisis in world history. One would imagine that the bookstores of the world would be packed with volumes on COVID. One would imagine that the Nobel Prize in medicine and chemistry would have gone to those, not to mention the rather dubious Nobel Peace Prize, would have gone to campaigners and scientists and doctors who were in the forefront of the fight against this scourge. One would imagine that political parties were outdoing themselves in order to present themselves as fighters with programs which address the pandemic. Nothing of the sort. The number of articles which have been produced by all so-called left organizations over the last three years, if you added them up, they would not equal the number of articles produced on the World Socialist website in any two or three months. Again, the most difficult challenge which we faced in putting this volume together, and it was in itself a Herculean task, was selecting out of the thousands of articles produced even in the first year, a representative sample. And that massive work will continue. We are following this virus, its development, the political and social questions. Now, the point is, how can one explain that we were the only ones who did it? I would add to this list, has there been a single movie anywhere that has addressed this? I mean, one thinks about a social crisis. Just in America, a million people have died. Worldwide, millions. Well, we know the reverberating impact of every human death. You know, what was the famous poem by Dryzen, Dry, uh, by Dunn? Every man's death diminishes me, for I am in love with mankind. Therefore ask not, for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. 
Well, apply that truth. We all are diminished by the loss of every human life. How many children have lost their grandparents? I'm at an age where I appreciate the significance of grandparenthood. And I know how important it was in my life. Over 10, and how many children have been orphaned? Coming over uh, to Australia, I was speaking to uh, a flight attendant who asked me about the uh, mask I was wearing, and she told me she had been sick three times. She's lost friends. Pilots who have died. And I hate to you know, be morbid about it, but how many people in critical uh, professions which require a tremendous level of daily attention have had their capacities diminished in one form or another by a disease, which is a multi-organ disease. I mean, this, this scourge has had vast social, economic, and I might add psychological consequences. And yet the bourgeoisie is incapable and unwilling to deal with any of it. And I must add, finally, this book is unique, COVID, Capitalism, and Class War. It has not, let us see where it is reviewed. And in fact, such is the level of intimidation. And I'm not going to mention names out of respect for the privacy and also an appreciation of the terrible pressures individuals have been working under. I mean, those who have spoken out face ostracism, persecution, and even prosecution. Uh, yes, uh, bourgeois society, bourgeois regimes are at war with their people. And I'll make just like one last point, the indifference to uh, nuclear war which we now see in every government, has been conditioned and prepared by the indifference to mass death. They don't give a damn. That's the horrible, horrible truth. Thank you uh, for those, those remarks, which I think were, were very helpful. We do have other questions uh, that have come in. One is from uh, Philip in Melbourne, who asks, Evan, could you explain more about the purpose and role of the World Socialist website Global Inquest into COVID? Yeah, no, I can make a number of points on that. Um, just initially, I would, you know, note that we launched the inquest in uh, November 2021, uh, just four days before news broke that the Omicron variant was rapidly spreading in South Africa. And really, I think uh, we had a number of discussions uh, in the lead up to publishing the statement announcing the inquest, and really it flowed out of the, the work that we did in uh, 2021, uh, in particular, the WSWS uh, hosted two major webinars on the pandemic in August and October, and uh, which brought together uh, scientists, uh, workers from throughout the world, uh, really, you know, centered on explaining uh, what had to be done to to bring an end to the pandemic. Um, and I would just note, sort of going off of uh, what Dave was just saying, I think really. Uh, the work that we've done with scientists throughout the pandemic has been essential. Uh, we've, you know, uh, every day we have discussions on the international editorial board about the state of the pandemic, uh, what the developments are, and you know we follow uh, the scientific literature uh, on social media, in particular on on Twitter, uh, and the uh, the work that uh, scientists have done there has been. Um, just immensely significant. And so over the course of 2021, uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Uh, Benjamin Mateus, who's our lead writer on the pandemic, uh, began to interview uh, a number of scientists, uh, Yanir Baryam, uh, Eric Feigelding, Jose Luis Jimenez, uh, and, and many others who have played really uh, critical roles uh, throughout the pandemic. 
And so then in August, we hosted this, uh, this webinar, which uh, after we, we published a statement really outlining the, uh, the potential and necessity uh, to eliminate uh, COVID, to eradicate COVID uh, and you know, eliminate it throughout the world, uh, stop all human to human transmission of the virus, which was at that point, uh, China had already uh, had a zero COVID policy in place for over a year. Uh, they had had, um, I don't know, the, I forget the precise number, but I think I believe it was less than 10 deaths basically from uh, May until that point. Um, actually, I think it was even less. I think it was less than five. Uh, New Zealand had eliminated COVID, uh, Vietnam, many other countries. And um, there was a major uh, paper that was put out by uh, Michael Baker, uh, basically arguing that it was possible to eradicate COVID. And we recognized really that the um, the science was absolutely clear uh, that this was possible, uh, but the what was fundamentally lacking was an understanding of this science within the, within the working class and an understanding of the the uh, really the the uh, political uh, significance of the pandemic and uh, you know what um, really the the crimes that had been committed. And so we uh, after these these uh, these webinars, um, you know, we decided that we would initiate uh, our own independent investigation, really with the fundamental aim of uh, educating the working class. And I think that uh, has really been central to uh, all of our work on the pandemic. And um, so I guess that, that would be the main point that I would make. But just, uh, you know, as the statement announcing the inquest outlines, uh, really, you know, the pandemic amounts to a monumental uh, social crime, uh, which has been committed uh, by governments throughout the world. Uh, you know, in particular, uh, the policies of of herd immunity. Uh, you know, by that point, uh, or at that point in the pandemic in November 2021, uh, there were many governments which were uh, not, which had not um, basically embraced this uh, this strategy of, of herd immunity and. Uh, Sorry, I'm going off on a bit, but uh, basically, you know, we um, we really recognized that uh, there was this profound need for uh, the working class to to draw the lessons from the pandemic, and so that's been the sort of the central aim of the inquest. Uh, we've interviewed uh, scientists, uh, experts. Um, you know, uh, one of the first interviews that we did was with uh, Nicholas Smith, where he comprehensively uh, exposed the the policies regarding masking and airborne transmission. Uh, one shortly after that was with Jose Luis Jimenez, which really, I think, you know, comprehensively indicted the role of the World Health Organization, the CDC, and other uh, public health agencies for their um, really refusal to educate society on airborne transmission. Uh, and then we've had dozens of interviews with workers and anti-COVID activists uh, from throughout the world, uh, in particular, many uh, patients uh, suffering from long COVID. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, um, you know, it's been very significant. Uh, there's also another uh, significant entry on the, uh, the policies of specific governments, the policies that have been implemented in uh, Brazil, uh, in, uh, in Sweden, uh, and the exporting of the herd immunity strategy globally. Uh, and another early testimony, which was critical, was from a scientist on the uh, zero COVID policy in China, which basically refuted or, um, you know, exposed all of the, the propaganda and lies that had been spread about that policy by uh, Western governments in particular. Um, so those are the, the main points that I would stress. Uh, thanks, Stephen. I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but uh, we do have a, a, another important question in from uh, Craig Wallace uh, from People with Disabilities Australia. And um, he asks, uh, and I think this is this is quite central to uh, the coverage on the, the WSWS and, and the book. Um, he asks, have you looked at the financial interests which are served by reducing the numbers of disabled and older people through COVID in reducing costs to the NDIS, that, that's disability care and aged care and social assistance? Um, he asks, are we seeing successive zoonotic plague events being opportunistically weaponized to produce eugenic outcomes? Um, 
and he, he adds this comment, I, I think, um, he says, uh, this time, human carnage works for them, thins the herd, cuts costs and makes people lead into fascism. There is incredible pressure to remain silent, but some of us have nothing to lose. Um, I think that's a very, you know, a very powerful statement, and certainly one that goes to the heart to uh, a number of a number of the, the statements in this book, um, which is, uh, you know, as as we've as you've been outlining. I mean, this this is a um, the means for, to combat the pandemic were very well known from the very beginning. Um, the science was not a mystery at all. Uh, in fact, it, it was uh, remarkable how quickly the, the virus was sequenced and, and, um, uh, and of course, the lockdown in Wuhan in China proved, demonstrated uh, that COVID could be eliminated. Uh, and yet um, a very different policy was pursued in, in virtually every country um, outside of China, uh, the, the uh, homicidal policy of herd immunity. And... I think this, you know, raises, of course, the, the the connection between between the two books we're discussing. I mean, Comrade North remarked, um, you know, the 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 real question uh, is, unless there is a socialist revolution, this planet is doomed, uh, and this is raised uh, just as much by the pandemic uh, as it is by uh, the uh, growing threat of nuclear war. Um, but I wonder, Evan, if, if you would like to uh, elaborate on the question that Craig has has raised about uh, what what are the financial interests uh, that are served by by this policy of um, herd immunity, uh, and particularly by the mass deaths among disabled elderly people um, who have who are most at risk. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's a very important question. Um, and I would just say, initially, we, I think we, as part of the inquest, we have to really uh, develop uh, specific investigations into sort of this very topic and how it's um, been implemented, uh, you know, in specific countries here in Australia uh, and throughout the world. But, but absolutely, this is, uh, this has been really a central aim of the uh, the bourgeoisie throughout the world to lower life expectancy, to reduce pension costs. And, you know, the pandemic was very much seized upon by uh, the most right-wing forces in society uh, to implement this policy. As, as we've said earlier, this, uh, the strategy of herd immunity was pioneered in, in Sweden. Uh, there's actually, there's explicit statements, which we've documented um, in the uh, a uh, testimony from Keith Begg, who's uh, an anti-COVID activist, uh, where uh, Johan Geisica, uh, Anders Tegnell were explicitly advocating for the spread of the virus. Uh, and uh, there's, you know, a quote, um, actually it was from, there's another uh, health official in Britain, which then copied this, uh, this policy, who explicitly said that the aim was to reduce pension costs, or that this would be a positive, uh, uh, you know, effect of this policy. Um, so this, yes, that's a, it's absolutely been, been central to the, or what, you know, it, yes, it's been central to the policy of, of herd immunity. Um, and, you know, I think really we've seen throughout the pandemic, this, uh, you know, this, uh, sort of a revival of, uh, eugenicist conceptions, uh, the Nazi conception of life unworthy of life. Um, and, you know, this, uh, this really, um, you know the the basically the the creating of conditions to uh, to call the elderly to um, to kill disabled people. Uh, you know I think there that yes this is it's a you know it's a very um, it's a very conscious policy uh, which we have to you know as I said we have to really expose how this is being um, implemented in each country uh, in the United States. One of the key figures who has uh, advocated this is. Uh, and or advocated lowering life expectancy is a man named uh, Ezekiel Emanuel, uh, who's the brother of uh, Rahm Emanuel, who was uh, Obama's uh, chief of staff, I believe during his first term. Uh, and Rahm Emanuel is famous for saying, uh, never let a good crisis go to waste, uh, which he said in response to the 2008 financial crisis uh, in which the ruling, which the ruling class used to uh, rip up uh, social spending uh, to funnel 
uh, massive amounts of money to the uh, to the rich, and that same strategy, uh, you know, underlied their approach to the pandemic. Um, this book documents, I think, really one of the critical elements of this book is the uh, documentation of what took place, uh, really, from late February uh, to May 2020. Uh, in particular, this was, uh, you know, all of the in the U.S. Uh, and internationally, this was the period when um, limited lockdowns were implemented, and then very rapidly in many countries, uh, very rapidly uh, reversed. And um, the uh, in the U.S., the the mantra uh, for this campaign was uh, coined by uh, New York Times columnist uh, Thomas Friedman, who said, uh, "The cure cannot be worse than the disease." And by that, he meant that the financial uh, interests of the, the ruling class, uh, the economic imperative, uh, the need to produce profits uh, could not be um, could not be impinged upon, uh, regardless of how many lives were lost, how many millions of people were infected and, and killed. And uh, Trump uh, seized upon this and used, you know, promoted this uh, this concept as part of the homicidal uh, back to work campaign, which was um, began immediately after the the passage of the the CARES Act. Um, so I don't know if Dave, you want to add anything. There's a lot that that could be said on this, but um, yes, I, I I just I think it's uh, really critical to understanding the pandemic, and we have to develop our analysis of this. I mean, thank you for those uh, important questions and uh, and answers. There is um, a question to Comrade Dave, who um, from Daniel who asks, uh, how can we combat apathy and cynicism in our fellow working class who believe themselves as individuals and as a whole powerless against the crushing mechanisms of global capitalism? The mood I find in my experience among, among people is that we have no control over history, current events and the future. This is incorrect, but how do you best inspire people to take up the cause? Well, there are two factors at work, uh, fundamentally. First of all, the driving force of social revolution is objective. Uh, Trotsky's, uh, the captain of Trotsky's guard in Kiowa Khan, Harold Robbins, whom I was privileged to know, uh, remarked to me that uh, in a discussion which Trotsky had with his guards where they were discussing precisely this question, Trotsky said, you know, everyone responds differently to an argument, but everyone responds the same way to a red-hot poker. And you can look at any time in history. <clears throat> uh, and Trotsky stressed this point in... Uh, the opening of history, his monumental, brilliant history of the Russian Revolution, he made the point that revolutions don't take place because human thought is so revolutionary. Actually, he said it's very conservative. Social consciousness lags far behind social being. The great objective forces which set masses of people into historical action develop, so to speak, behind their backs. You might say that the last indicator of a revolutionary crisis is a sudden eruption of a mass movement. Uh, in the formation of in the, uh, the origins of historical materialism, uh, you might say of a scientific approach to history out of, of, which, of which Marxism became the highest expression, uh, was the French Revolution. <clears throat> its eruption in 1789 and its development seemed to pursue a logic of its own. Th there was this thing called the revolution, uh, which took its twists and turns from day to day, its ups and downs, no one knew what this thing would do on any given day, but what was this revolution? Continuous and violent eruptions of masses of people, often unexpectedly, at a point even when within the revolution, 
reaction seemed triumphant. And it was really the attempt, in a sense, to understand what this event was, how it took place, uh, from which or was one of the uh, central political or historical driving forces of uh, an understanding that history is an objective process. Of course, there is confusion. There is, compared to the scale of the crisis, uh, consciousness lags far behind. But there is this sort of molecular process, a growing awareness of that things are becoming impossible. What we're describing, whether when we talk about the um, pandemic, this is a great social shock. The books which we have produced, the articles, uh, have sought to make this comprehensible and conscious. We, as a historical entity, the ICFI is the most conscious actor in the historical process, but we didn't fall from the sky. You know, we exist and we are ourselves an expression, but at a very conscious level of a historical process. Now, what is going to change the moods of discouragement, the, the overused word of demoralization? Potrotsky said it very simply. He said all these moods were created by events and they'll be changed by events. People are driven into struggle. Marx once said it very well, talking about different class reactions in a period of crisis, the middle class becomes nervous, the working class gets angry. And it's true. <clears throat> Masses of workers, once they enter into struggle, become ever more conscious of themselves as a historical force. Objective conditions of working class life incline workers toward a more collectivist view. They work together, they rely on collaboration. The middle class, middle class elements approach things differently, but nevertheless, this process is taking place. I, I must say, you know, we don't worry very much about whether or not there's going to be a revolutionary movement. We know there will, that will happen. It's happened in the past. It will happen again. Why should our epoch be so different? It may appear that the challenges are very great, but they were always very great. You know, before, Marx grew up in, when he, his childhood was spent in the age of Metternich. The quadruple, whatever they call alliance of reactionary forces, all arrayed against revolution. But the revolution happened because changes were taking place in the structure of society that gave rise to the explosions of 1848. Then came another period of reaction, out of which 1871 emerged. The suppression of the con commune. over a long period, then gave rise to a resurgence of the new working class based on the emergence of what was modern industry, the industrial proletariat, mass socialist movements. Now, there is a historical process. Now, we, don't, we know that is at work, and we study it. We are particularly struck by the global character of the productive process. Transnational production is a great objective force in the bringing together of workers all over the world. And we are introducing in our own intervention this understanding. For example, we're involved in a strike of Clarios workers who produce batteries. We now know, of course, that uh, electro electronic vehicles is the wave of the future. This will become an essential part of production with vast implications. We are doing our best and with success to introduce into the struggle of these workers at Clarios a greater awareness of the international dimensions of their fight. The ICFI has been working on that since really the 18, 1980s, and it's being verified. We said 35 years ago 
that in the next great wave of working class struggles, the workers will tend to consciously identify themselves as an international class. Now, so we know that. You know, that is a scientific element of our analysis. But we also know that revolutions are not a purely objective process. They're carried through by people. And revolutions, while producing great changes in consciousness, also require that consciousness is not one of pure militancy. It must be politically directed. And so the development of a leadership of a conscious section of the working class, drawing the most advanced elements forward, is a critical element in the victory of the socialist revolution. We've had discussions in Australia about this issue, and I've uh, recently came across a quotation which I thought is enormously important, uh, where Trotsky is speaking at the Dewey Commission of 1937, answering you know, the case of the Stalinists which they had put forward, such as it were, at the Moscow trials. And he was asked, well, is it true that uh, the Fourth International, the Trotskyist movement, uh, is for war? because you believe that war leads to revolution. And he said, well, that's a totally absurd falsification of our attitude. Yes, wars do lead to revolutions, but wars don't necessarily lead to successful revolutions. The success of a revolution depends upon the existence of a working class leadership, a Marxist party. Without that, neither wars nor revolutions bring anything good. The peculiar character of revolutions in our epoch is that they require a great understanding of the historical process by the workers of the very struggle in which they are engaged. So that is the really the decisive issue here. Yes, the, the, to, to quote, I mean, the situation in revolutionary periods are always difficult. Lincoln, a great bourgeois revolution, revolutionary, said in his famous State of the Union, I believe in 1862, he said, the occasion is piled high with difficulties. As our case is new, so we must think anew. We must disenthrall ourselves. And, said, and so we will save our union. Yeah. We have to rise with the occasion. It always, revolutionary situations present themselves always in the most existential terms. It's really all or nothing. Yeah. That's what we have to understand. And I think uh, we can see that the processes through which we're passing have the potential for staggering advance or catastrophic failure and disaster. We have reached the point of, um, now every, the, the new thing everyone's talking about is AI, artificial intelligence. There is no doubt that this is a extraordinary advance in technology, which can have, if utilized correctly and developed correctly, with the help of AI itself, vast implications. We also know that it can have catastrophic consequences. Yes, it can lead to the loss of employment for countless millions and millions of people, including, by the way, in the tech industries. There are many things which are now, which require direct human labor, which will be done semi-automatically. And if this technology remains in the hands of the ruling elites, utilized only for their own enrichment, the results will be disastrous. You know, And they'll apply AI to figuring out how best to send off nuclear weapons to annihilate their opponents, or how to create biological weapons uh, who, uh, which can be targeted to certain 
genetic models. I mean, this is the crazy things these people are working on. So this technology must be seized by the working class. In fact, we must use this technology in the interest of developing the revolutionary movement in the development of revolutionary strategy and tactics. So that's how the issues pose themselves today. So I just want to say there is an objective process. Don't second guess history. It's creating a revolution. We're living in revolutionary times. But the particular challenge is to build a movement that wins the working class and its most advanced elements and among the youth, among intellectuals, among the most far-sighted elements in uh, among artists. Uh, I mean, just want to make the point. I mean, that you know, doctors and scientists who have gone through this experience are horrified by what they're seeing. And I know we're. Our writings are being very widely followed. I would urge the uh, scientists and doctors who are following this or to uh, turn their eyes and their consciousness toward the working class. That's the force that you need to mobilize. If you can't do it by yourselves. You can only do it uh, in affiliation with uh, the revolutionary movement. And I think we've proven, we've proven that.